All right, get ready, because today we're diving deep into a sound, a song even, from way, way back. Further back than you might even imagine. Oh, absolutely. We're talking older than the pyramids, older than, you know, even the Bible. I think you can handle going that far back. I think so. Those are some pretty old benchmarks. We're stepping back almost 3,500 years. We are. This deep dive is all about the Hurrian hymn number six, and it dates all the way back to about 1400 BCE. Wow. 1400 BCE. That's incredible. I can already imagine some of our listeners are thinking, how could they possibly have found a song from that long ago? Right. It's wild. But here's the really fascinating part. We actually have an idea of how this ancient hymn sounded. It's almost like digging up a, a sonic time capsule buried by a, a civilization lost to time. That's a great way to put it. And to find that time capsule, we have to go to the 1950s to the ruins of an ancient city, Ugarit. Ugarit, now in modern-day Syria. Yeah, archaeologists were working at um, what they think was a royal palace. And while they were working there, they found a bunch of clay tablets. Not just any clay tablets, though. These were inscribed with hymns. And get this musical notations etched right onto the clay. It's like finding like a lost treasure chest of sheet music, but from, you know, thousands of years ago. <laughs> and one of those tablets, it's known as hymn number six, was really well preserved. Incredibly rare to find something that well preserved from that time period. It gave scholars this amazing chance to uncover the musical secrets of the Hurrian people. That's incredible. But I have to ask, I mean, how do you even start to figure out a language of music that's so old? It sounds kind of like an Indiana Jones movie, honestly. It kind of is, oh. in a way. The lyrics themselves, those were written in hurry. It's a language, actually, that we're still trying to completely understand today. Oh, yeah. But the real breakthrough, the key to unlocking the music, was in the notation. It was written in Akkadian, and scholars, they know that language pretty well. So it's like they found a Rosetta Stone, but for music? Exactly. So what secrets did they unlock? What did this musical Rosetta Stone tell us? Well, they found out the system they were using. It used intervals that told the musician which strings on a nine-stringed lyre they should be playing. It's like a, like a recipe, but for an ancient hit single. And speaking of which, the transcript I read mentions something called a diatonic scale. What's that? Oh, oh yeah, a diatonic scale. Think of the do re mi scale. That's a diatonic scale, a really basic musical structure. Okay, so like the foundation for a lot of music. Exactly. The cool thing is that scale was already being used over 3,000 years ago by the Hurrians. See, that's what I love about these deep dives, learning about this stuff. I had no idea that something like the do re mi scale was that old. So we've got the sheet music. We know what the notes are. The real question is, what did this ancient hymn actually sound like? And what stories were those notes trying to tell? I mean, it's one thing to see the notes on a page, but it's another to imagine someone actually playing them, singing along. You, yeah. know. you know, it makes you think about the people who created this music. Who were the Hurrians? What was their world like? Yeah, what was their deal? Well, imagine, if you can, the Bronze Age, right? Empires like Egypt, the Babylonians, they are at their height. The Hurrians weren't really like them, though. How so? Think more spread out, influencing things, mm. but not a big, powerful empire. Their territory stretched across parts of what we now call Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. Okay, so a little more uh, decentralized. Yeah, connected by their culture, their traditions, and as we're seeing their music, they were adaptable too. Adaptable? How so? They'd blend their culture with others, pick up new ideas, technologies as they moved around. So even though they weren't building huge monuments and stuff, they were still making their mark. Definitely. And when we look at this hymn, dedicated to their goddess of orchards, we start to get a feel for what was important to them. This wasn't just about pleasing a god. It was about their survival. Ah, right. Back then, a bad harvest. That was a big deal. Huge. So they poured their artistry into this music, into this hymn because it was that vital. It's like music is a matter of life or death, almost. In a way, yeah. It makes you wonder what other kinds of music they had. Sadly, we just don't know, at least not yet. It's like finding one page of an, an entire music book. What did their other songs sound like? What instruments did they play? So many questions. We can analyze the little bits and pieces where we have other fragments of notation, pieces of instruments, that kind of thing. So there's hope. Always. I like that. So this hurry in hymn number six it's a treasure for sure, but it's probably just one small part of a much bigger picture. Absolutely. This is what I love about these deep dives, uncovering these mysteries from the past. Okay, so we've talked about the music part of this hymn, but what about the lyrics themselves? What are they actually saying? You're right. We should talk about the lyrics. Even though we only have fragments, they are packed with meaning. 
they paint pictures with words, almost like like a prayer across time. Okay, you have to elaborate on that. What kind of imagery? They talk about the goddess Nicole's beauty. They compare her to precious metals, to a cedar forest. Wow, that's pretty poetic. It is. And there's this plea for her to look kindly upon them, to bless them with her favor. It's interesting how some things never change, even after all these years. Yeah, like wanting to be beautiful or protected. We still want those things today. Although I did read about them offering her sesame oil. That seems a little um, random. Ah, sesame oil was a big deal back then. It meant good things were coming. A plentiful harvest, you know. I guess I take those things for granted. Like, I see sesame oil at the grocery store and I don't think twice. Right. But for them, it represented their hopes, their fears, their very survival. It really makes you realize how much we take for granted and how much we can learn from people who lived so long ago. But I have to wonder... Is this the only hymn like this that they've found? So just this one song then. Have they found any other Hurrian music? Well, never say never in archaeology, right? True. There are always new discoveries. But for now, it sounds like the Hurrian hymn. That's all we've got. One complete song. So where do researchers even go from here? It's like, imagine trying to put together a puzzle, but with like only a handful of pieces. Ouch. Yeah, that's rough. But also kind of exciting. Because there are other clues out there, like we have these little bits of other musical notations, pieces of instruments they've dug up, even some art that shows musicians. Okay, so it's like a, a musical scavenger hunt almost. Sort of. <laughs> and by looking at those clues, comparing them to what we know from Hymn Deborah 6, we can start to, like, fill in the blanks a little. So if Hymn Deborah 6 is like finding a whole symphony perfectly preserved, these other little pieces, it's like finding a single note here, a musical phrase there. Exactly. And just like someone might like reconstruct a vase from broken pieces, experts can use these fragments to maybe piece together melodies, rhythms, maybe even whole genres of music that have been lost for centuries. That's mind-blowing. So this one, him, as amazing as it is, it could just be scratching the surface of what hurrying music was really like. It really shows you that every new discovery, it can change everything we thought we knew. It's like this conversation, you know, back and forth, always learning and reevaluating. And in this case, the conversation is about the actual sounds of this lost civilization. Music that meant something to them. Music that moved them. Music that connected them to their gods, to the world around them, to each other. Music that goes beyond words, beyond time, even. It makes you appreciate music in a whole new way. It's more than just entertainment. It's how we express ourselves, how we connect with each other. It's human. It goes back to, who knows, our earliest ancestors gathered around a fire making music. And it leads all the way to the hurry and hymn and beyond. Wow, that's heavy. It makes you think, you know. Here we are listening to our playlists. And thousands of years ago, someone was listening to that hymn written on that clay tablet. Music has some serious staying power. It makes you wonder, what will people find when they look back at our music? Right. What will they think when they dig up our Spotify playlists? It's an interesting thought experiment for sure. It really is. Well, there you have it, our deep dive into the oldest known song in the world, the Hurrian Hymn Number 6. We talked about its history, the mystery surrounding it, and the incredible things it can teach us. A song that shows us how powerful music is. It connects us to the past and can even inspire the future. It's been a wild ride through time. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, keep exploring and keep listening. You never know what sonic wonders you might discover.